Good morning, everybody. And it's my honor to be hosting the first full session of conference with, of course, the man right at the heart of government, Michael Gove. So, Michael, we would have been looking forward to welcoming you to Birmingham, but sadly, that can't be so for conference. But it makes me think, of course, 12 months ago, we were in Manchester, full of energy, looking forward to a general election, which came very soon afterwards. But of course, it's been an incredibly difficult year since then. So just to get us going, I'd love to hear your reflections on the year, the highs and the lows. Thank you very much, Andy. Thank you. It is a pity that we're not in Birmingham uh, this year. Um, conference um, is a very, very special time in the, in the political life of all of us. Um, and Birmingham, I think, is absolutely the place that we would all want to be. But the last 12 months, you're right, since that Manchester conference have been tumultuous. Amanda's been reminding us, of course, of how we all felt on election night. Mm -hmm. um, and amazing range of victories and of course particularly in the West Midlands you know some amazingly talented new MPs like Gary Sembrook and Birmingham Northfield um, and others who were elected uh, in seats that had historically been Labour it was a wonderful feeling and uh, on the 31st of January the day that we left the European Union I was in the West Midlands in the evening <laughs> I had the chance to speak to <laughs> Dudley Conservatives to talk to Marco Longhi our newly elected MP um, uh, in uh, Dudley North, along with others, and to celebrate the fact that, that Boris had got Brexit done. But of course, what we didn't know at that time, um, when I was enjoying myself mm. in Dudley, was that the dark shadow of the coronavirus was spreading from China. And undoubtedly, one of the big challenges of the last few months has been grappling with the impact of the coronavirus. And I know that um, particularly in our urban centers, there's been an impact on business, on hospitality, on the lives of students and of course there's been a health impact uh, which has touched uh, I think every family in the country um, and I've had the privilege of working with the Prime Minister during that period I remember vividly the news that the Prime Minister had been taken into hospital and then into intensive mm. care I think it was a moment when the whole country uh, held its breath uh, and rallied round um, Boris made a, 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 an amazing recovery. He's now back at the heart of government, displaying enormous energy. He's the, you know, he's the livest wire in the room. But there is a lot that we do need to do because as we come up to the end of this year, not only do we need to make sure that we are dealing with the virus effectively, we've also got to build back better. Um, our economic recovery needs to gather steam. Um, and we also need to make sure that uh, the, the particular challenges that we face at the end of the transition period on December the 31st we're ready for, but the new opportunities after January the 1st we also take advantage of. So, Michael, I'm sure there'll be mountains of discussion about the government's coordination of the attack on the pandemic. But I think this morning I want to ask you about yes. some of the other things that you are directly responsible for. And of course, we'll have some questions from uh, delegates, virtual delegates, just in a little time. But if, and I'm hoping for a scoop in this first question. I'm going to push mm. my luck. We know you're the man at the heart of the Brexit negotiations. So what chance this free trade deal? Well, I'm optimistic. Um, uh, the principal negotiator is David Frost, Lord Frost, um, and I'm one of his wingmen um, uh, helping to make sure that we get this over the line. Um, and it's been a tough process because uh, the EU has never had to cope with any country leaving its orbit before. Um, and it's a bit difficult, you know, um, as, we, as we leave the nest and we become good neighbours, rather than um, uncomfortable lodgers, the EU has to adjust. Um, and several of the aspects of adjustment have proved difficult for the European Union, recognising that we, we share the same high environmental and workforce standards that they do, but we want to do things in our own way um, is, is a bit difficult for them. And also there's a very vexed issue to do with fisheries. The EU think that they should have exactly the same access to our waters outside the European Union as they had inside. But I think that with goodwill, we should be able to get a deal. The Prime Minister is talking to the European mm. Commission President Ursula von der Leyen later today. Um, and again, you know, I suspect that there'll be one or two ups and downs on the way. But I am optimistic that we will get a deal. But if we don't, we have been making extensive preparations to be ready for anything. You know, the British people voted for us to leave. We are determined to honour that. But obviously, if we can secure a negotiated outcome and a free trade agreement, that would be hugely helpful for sectors of the economy, not least the automotive sector. Absolutely. And I have to say, take this opportunity while I have your ear. 
uh, that really, really matters to the West Midlands, of course, the future of the car industry. So we're very much behind you in that negotiation and hoping for that free trade deal. Well, uh, again, Andy, you've been a, a, an amazing champion for not just the, the whole economy of the West Midlands, but in particular for the automotive sector. And we know that JLR and other companies are flagship British manufacturing uh, concerns. And, and it's also the case that they're forward looking. I remember visiting with you oh, yes. and, and looking at the future mm. of transport and recognising that we're at the cutting edge of technology. We want to do everything possible to make sure that uh, the, those great manufacturing companies and the thousands of jobs that depend on them are safe um, and are capable of taking advantage of the new opportunities that free trade will bring. Uh, again, our colleague Liz Truss has got a free trade deal with Japan, the world's third largest economy, better than the deal that we had when we were in the EU. So let's hope we get that EU deal and that we can get the other trade agreements um, uh, as part of that suite of free trade deals as well. Thank you. Very encouraging. That bit. Now, the other big subject, of course, that taking us right back to last December's mm. uh, general election is, of course, levelling up. Mm. It's so It was so right at the heart of the Conservative promise back in December. And it's tough to keep the focus on that yes. one the, when the pandemic has come and blown us and attacked us all. But I know you are absolutely resolute in that commitment. So just tell us a little bit how you think that'll shape up. Yeah, I mean, the Prime Minister um, uh, said during the crisis and has told us in the Cabinet that, that far from retreating from levelling up, we need to double down. And the reason for that is that as we look at the impact of, of COVID on our country, it's reinforced a key insight at the heart of Boris's approach towards the future of the country. And that is that while um, uh, talent is spread equally across the country, opportunity is not. Um, and we know that there have been uh, uh, some vivid examples of the way in which COVID has hit some communities worse than others. And we also know that the, the economic difficulties that COVID has inevitably created will have an impact on some parts of the country greater than others. And so what we really need to do is to uh, uh, build back better by being a more cohesive country. And that means specifically making sure that in the West Midlands, in the Northwest, in Teesside and in Tyneside, that we make the investments required in order to give people the economic opportunity and the chance to recover, which is so important. And that means everything from looking at free ports, um, which will be opportunities for all of us to make sure that uh, uh, there can be new enterprising free trading centres of excellence in areas like Teesside. It also means that we need to look at uh, big transport projects. Uh, the government has backed HS2. It's vitally important that we build on that with improved uh, transport links across the country. But we also need to look at skills as well. And the Prime Minister outlined earlier this week uh, his approach through the Lifetime Skills Guarantee to making sure that vocational and technical education, so critical to our economic recovery, is something we invest in. And in one area that I'm particularly um, uh, close to, we're also looking at government jobs. Oh, yeah. Far too many government jobs tend to be in uh, the Westminster and Whitehall village. Um, we have an amazing civil service and it's drawn its resources and people from lots of different communities, I think we now need to give back to those communities as well. And I think we need some of the big government departments and the big decision makers, not in London, but closer to where the action is in the West Midlands, the North West, Teesside and Tyneside. That is a very encouraging answer because actually I'm going to turn to the iPad now and the questions that have come in. And the first one, in a sense, you have covered. It simply says, it's from an anonymous uh, contributor, are you going to move government departments north? And if so, will you make sure there are jobs for local people? So I think in a sense, you've answered yes. that, Michael. No, absolutely. And, and again, one of the things uh, in the past is that people um, of great talent from across the United Kingdom have looked to London and felt that London is the place that they, they have to go in order to make sure that their, their career can develop. Um, I want it to be the case that um, uh, whether you're in um, uh, Middlesbrough or in Mansfield or in Manchester, um, that uh, economic and career opportunity is close to home in the community that you care about. Um, and that's part of what levelling up means. Absolutely. And the civil service can play a, a part yeah. in that. And one of the things that we do need to do is to make sure that there are centres of excellence so that you have uh, uh, men and women in the civil service, men and women in the private sector, and men and women in academia working together. And that's one of the things, if I may say so, about the West Midlands, which is you've got great higher education institutions, great uh, further education uh, colleges, and you've also got an amazing private sector economy, 
government needs to play its part as well in helping to bring uh, that together so that if we're looking at, for example, at the future of, uh, of the car industry and transport, you've got uh, the, you know, the innovation of our brightest technologists, you've got the, uh, the smarts that uh, you see in uh, some of those top companies, but government also needs to play its part as well in the new energy technologies that will uh, fire up that recovery. And just an example of where that's working well, which isn't about the car industry in the West Midlands, take Homes England. Yes. They have recently moved their second headquarters to Coventry. Yes. Brilliant that actually we've got that government agency thinking about our whole approach to yes. building more homes. And it's been, as I understand it, extremely successful. Yes. And a part of the, the, the world that's very dear to me, the northeast of England, you have uh, in Newcastle University excellence in the life sciences field. And I think one of the things that we do need to do is to recognise that our Universities are often at the heart mm, of right. um, economic success. Um, and we have great universities across the UK. So in places like Newcastle, uh, we really should make the most of the, uh, the constellation of talent that is there. And government has a critical role to play. Brilliant. So you've whetted the appetite of lots of people around the country for that now. So they'll all be looking forward to welcoming uh, those, uh, those government organisations. Right. Now, the next one, while we're sticking on geographies, this is from Scotland. And it simply says, with the Scottish election next year, what is your message to Scottish voters who want to protect the union? Well, I think... Uh, we're all aware that next May there are going to be really important elections um, in Wales, um, in the West Midlands, um, in Teesside, and of course in Scotland. Um, and in Scotland, the choice essentially will be between uh, uh, Nicola Sturgeon um, and Douglas Ross. I know mm. the, uh, uh, the Scottish Conservatives are the second largest party in Scotland, and uh, they are the strongest voice for keeping the United Kingdom together. Correct. Um, uh, I have friends in, in uh, Scotland who are Labour and Liberal Democrat voters and I have a lot of time and respect for them. But uh, Keir Starmer recently has said that uh, if uh, Nicola Sturgeon were to win a, uh, a mandate, as he sees it, a majority, um, at the, uh, the next Holyrood Scottish Parliament elections, uh, he might consider a referendum. I don't think a referendum is in anyone's interests at all. So if we want to have a strong pro-union voice, then it's Douglas Ross and the Scottish Conservatives. But more broadly, the question will be, well, what is it about the United Kingdom that is so important, particularly at the moment? I think the COVID crisis has reminded us, actually, mm. that we are stronger together. And when it comes to the economic response that has helped protect jobs in Scotland and livelihoods in Scotland, it's been the broad shoulders of the UK Treasury. It's been the, the, you know, the great policy-making genius of Rishi Sunak that has meant that we've been able to recover together. Um, and in a way, I think we've had the best of both worlds. We've had a devolved Scottish Parliament that can make decisions close to the ground that it thinks are right, and a strong UK government backing it up every step of the way. If, um, if Scotland were independent, then uh, it, unfortunately, the economic recovery um, would be much more uh, difficult. Uh, the uh, UK Treasury can borrow money on international markets more cheaply. The pound sterling enables us to invest in a uh, more uh, uh, secure and uh, uh, powerful way. Um, and of course, the UK internal market means that uh, the unfettered access that Scottish businesses have to the rest of the UK sustains more than half a million jobs. All that would be put at peril if there was constitutional uncertainty. The other thing about the United Kingdom is it's a success story about inclusion. If you look at the UK, you know, you've got the uh, four different peoples together, but it's more than just uh, Scotland, Wales and uh, uh, England and Northern Ireland historically. Modern Britain, you'll know from the West Midlands, oh, yes. I know from um, London and Surrey, yeah. is a success story of inclusion. And if you look at our Conservative cabinet, Rishi, Alloc, uh, uh, Suella, Pretty, there's no other government anywhere in the world um, which is so inclusive as our own. Um, and that reflects the fact that the UK is all about working together. And I think, you know, if there's one lesson to take away from the difficult last 12 months, it is mm. we're stronger together. And that's why the United Kingdom is something in which we want to, want to invest and strengthen. Excellent. And this won't surprise you, having had the Scottish question, someone oh. had to put a question in from Wales. Oh. So, it's a, so, so to show our completeness over this, and yes. I'll ask you to be brief on this because mm. some other big questions coming up. Yeah. Uh, 
it says simply, uh, it seems that the Conservatives are looking at losing a lot of seats in Wales. I'm not so sure about that. Mm. But what do you say to the Welsh public to stick with the Conservatives? Well, I think actually there's a chance that we could have, for the first time, a Conservative First Minister in Wales. At the last general election, we won seats in Wales and we've got fantastic new MPs like Sarah Atherton in Wrexham uh, who are doing a wonderful job for their constituents, Virginia Crosby in Ines Mon, a seat that's you know been... Uh, Labour in Plaid Cymru, Conservative MP doing a brilliant job. And I think the thing that we can argue is if you want investment in Wales, it's far better to have Conservatives in Cardiff Bay working with Conservatives in Westminster in the interests of all. And a Conservative government um, in Cardiff Bay will ensure that you get value for money, investment in infrastructure, whether it's um, on, on the M4 or uh, whether it's the links between Holyhead and Merseyside, um, we can work together in that area. Um, you know, no disrespect to the individuals in the Welsh Labour Party who are currently in office at the moment, but they just don't have the ability to deliver for Wales in a way that Conservative politicians would. And if I may say, that was the story of the West Midlands as well. People Absolutely. said there is no chance of us winning, and we did, and we beat, beat the Labour establishment. So my message to the Welsh is be confident. Exactly, and as a result, you've been able to deliver because you're working effectively with uh, a Conservative government in Westminster. That is the, the secret sauce for Wales' economic recovery. Cooperation between Cardiff and Westminster with Conservatives in power in both. Excellent. Right, next uh, comes, the next question comes from Councillor Ed Gretton. And again, it's about another issue very close to my heart, actually. To boost our economy and jobs, are we bringing forward as many infrastructure projects as possible? Particularly, he's called out road, but of course there's rail, yes. there's internet and everything else. Yes. Again, it's a passion of Boris's. Um, Levelling up is about making sure that economic opportunity is spread more equally across the country. That makes sense because if we can unleash talent in every part of our country, we can perform better on the international stage. You know, one of the things that's held us back in the past is that uh, certain parts of the, of the country have punched above their weight, mm. others have been overlooked, and as a result, the talent there hasn't been given the chance to flourish. That's bad for the individuals, bad for the communities, but also bad for all of our economies. That's right. um, and we need to work together. And, and critical to that is linking people up. So I mentioned HS2 briefly earlier, controversial with some, but absolutely necessary in order to make sure that the economic spine of the country is strengthened. But we also need local rail infrastructure. We need local road infrastructure. We need to improve uh, uh, the public transport system, and that's an investment not just in, in light rail, in uh, metro, and in bus networks. But we also, as you quite rightly point out, need to think about um, uh, uh, infrastructure uh, which will enable digital growth in the future. Uh, 5G is going to be critical to that. Um, and I think we need to emulate those countries like South Korea, um, which recognise that government investment in digital infrastructure helps unleash the private sector's creative energies to, to generate the jobs that will drive prosperity in the future. So, uh, Councillor Ed, I think we can call that a pretty categoric answer there, Absolutely, Michael. Yes. And I have to say, thank you for the support for HS2. No. Really critical to the Midlands going forward. Now, you mentioned changes and mm. uh, as a result of COVID. And this one from Dr Mario uh, Trabuco simply says, what do you think about the working from home revolution yes. as a chance to actually be part of the levelling up agenda through the redistribution? Yes. Yeah. I think, I think it's a very perceptive question. Um, I think that um, working from home has, of course, been enabled by um, the, you know, the digital infrastructure that we have. So uh, people particularly, obviously, um, in office roles have found that uh, Zoom and, if I'm allowed to say, Microsoft Teams <laughs> have, <are> <laughs> have, have enabled people to work in, in new ways. Um, I think the future for many will be a mixture of working from home and working in the office. The, the future won't be uh, completely one or the other. Um, it will be a combination. There are, you know, as human beings, we, we thrive on social contact, but it can also be the case that working from home means that it is easier to combine work and family life. Um, and it's also sometimes the case that productivity can be far greater when freed of, of some of those distractions and able to concentrate um, on the task in hand. Of course, we also know that there are some jobs which you just obviously cannot do from home. And that's why during the course of this crisis, it's been very clear that in a COVID secure workplace, whether that is a, uh, a factory or a school, um, then uh, life can go on 
not quite as before, but people can be working um, uh, uh, in uh, that environment that uh, they've been used to. But the key thing about the, uh, the changes that have been enabled from working for home is exactly we can look at the future and say you don't need to have a concentration of people in a Whitehall department operating in that way. You can have uh, the decision makers dispersed. You can have people who are uh, operating digitally, who may come in for particular meetings, but who can live and work and contribute to the life of the communities uh, uh, that they love outside London or outside some of our major urban centres. So thinking more flexibly about how we work can help with levelling up and it can also help once the economic recovery really takes uh, um, uh, hold. It can also help with making sure that um, people can have more time for uh, the family life um, that is at the heart of um, uh, you know, the happiness of so many. Lovely. Lots more we'll hear on this, I think, over coming yes. months. Now, you touched on this a little, but I'm going to push you a little bit more on it because it's a mm. question come in from Lynette. Mm. Obviously, we know there will be significant redundancies mm. on the back of COVID, despite yes. everything that's been done. That is unavoidable. Mm. But the response to it, Lynette asks, will there be support and encouragement for UK industry and manufacturing in particular? Yes. Um, we recognise that uh, you can't have a successful economy in a country like the United Kingdom unless manufacturing is part of it. Um, and a successful economy depends on, uh, obviously, financial and business services. It depends on uh, uh, innovation. But financial and business services need manufacturing as the bedrock which they support. And innovation comes, in many cases, from manufacturing. Now, that manufacturing can be in uh, a areas which um, uh, Britain has led on in the past, like um, uh, uh, aviation and aerospace, as well as the automotive sector. It can come from areas where we are strong, but where we can be even stronger, like pharmaceuticals. It can also be in areas like life science and robotics and artificial intelligence and so on. But we absolutely do need to invest in these areas. And we need to make sure that we've got the, the workforce required. So that involves both the, uh, the people who will be the technicians and the fixers of the future. That's why the Lifetime Skills Guarantee mm, and investment in cool. technical and vocational education counts so much. But it will also come from some of the, uh, the cutting edge technology in which our great universities are investing. Um, but it will also come from making sure that um, uh, we have a strong free market culture in this country, so people are prepared to take risks, invest, and reap the reward. The final thing that I would say is that, of course, there's going to be some inevitable, as you say, uh, churn in the job market. One of the key things about the Lifetime Skills Guarantee is that it acknowledges that as some industries employ fewer people, others will employ more, and we need to be there for people at every stage in their life to help. You know, in the past, um, people have worried about the, the job-destroying impact of technology. So people worried when mm. cars were invented that that would be the end of the line for uh, people who are working mm. as groups. People, um, you know, obviously worried when um, uh, you had some of the digital breakthroughs that we've had, mm. that that would mean the end of employment in particular areas. Yes, but it also meant that new jobs were created. So, you know, one of the areas in which the UK excels, um, which is uh, the computer gaming industry, there are thousands of jobs there um, employing people who are creative, highly skilled, technically adept. Those jobs simply didn't exist 30 years ago, so there will be new jobs in the future, but we need to be agile and government needs to help. And we need to be there for people who, at a time which is full of possibility, is also potentially disorientating, saying, we will support you. So that's why the retraining is so important. So complete apps. So if I may just say, it was lovely to hear the Prime Minister call out what we called our digital boot camps when he did his speech oh, yes. on Tuesday. Great success. Mm. We piloted. Great to see that now being taken nationally. But it's exactly what you're talking about, yes. Michael. Now, the next question is completely different. And I know you feel very strongly about this. So I'll read it out word for word. Sean Hegarty asks, how can we help those who say they are unable to openly share their political opinion in fear of backlash from friends, family, unions, employers and so on? Well, I, th I, I do sympathise because one of the things that um, is a feature of our times is that you sometimes see, particularly on social media, mm. what's being called cancel culture. Mm. Um, and that means that if people uh, uh, say something that uh, others deem to be uh, beyond the pale, um, then they're told 
um, uh, your views are, are wrong or disreputable or unworthy. I think free speech is so important. It's the way in which society moves forward and makes progress. We test ideas. We should always do that in a courteous way and a respectful way and learn from others. And if any of us uh, you know, find that a, a strong contrary view is put forward, we can always learn from that. But uh, one of the things that is particularly difficult, I think, is that there are some workplaces where people who are conservative or right of center feel that it is something that they, they have to hide. I, I think that we should welcome, um, in any workplace, a range and a diversity of views. And one of the things that I've tried to say about government service overall is everyone who's a civil servant wants the government to succeed. Absolutely, that's, that's the professionalism at the heart of it. But also, I want people with different perspectives on life. I want people who have um, perhaps spent a significant part of their time as a carer mm. and who bring a particular sense of experience and compassion. People who may not have had an easy time educationally in the first part of their life, but who are flourishing later and who therefore know what adversity means. And in the same way, I think in every workplace, you benefit from having people, maybe some people who are conservative, maybe some people who are uh, liberal, who feel that their own life experience is valued. Because it goes back to what we were talking about earlier. Countries only succeed when you think that everyone yeah. is valuable. And, and you may disagree with someone, but if you make the effort to understand, you benefit as a result and we're all stronger. Excellent, so Sean, I hope that's an encouraging answer for you. And we've got time for just two more questions, if we're relatively quick, hint, hint. Mm -hmm. So the first one comes from Lynn Jameson. And again, I think this is very interesting. It's been a really tough time in mm. government to get messages across. Yes. The whole question of communication during the crisis, unprecedented mm. challenge, really. So what are your reflections on that and how government needs to think about the communication process? Yes, it has been difficult, um, uh, in particular because of COVID. It's a new virus and we've all had to respond as we discover more about how it works. And people understandably say, well, we were recommended to do this a few months ago and now we're recommended mm. to do that. The reason why is that as we know more about the virus, we can be uh, more precise in the advice that we offer. But uh, I would say that my friend Matt Hancock has been very good at establishing clear messages at critical moments. So uh, the hands, face, space message about how we protect others um, and also the rule of six, some people don't like it, but it is certainly clear Simple. Um, about how we operate. These are real gains. We have an amazingly gifted communicator in our Prime Minister and also a very warm and authoritative uh, uh, communicator in our Chancellor of the Exchequer. Um, I think the important thing for all of us to do is just to make sure that um, we provide them with the platforms in order to get that message out. Because we also, and we touched on it briefly, have a media, and I used to be a journalist, that thrives on trying to uh, say, oh, there's confusion and, uh, and thrives on criticism. That's fair enough. That is their job. But our job as conservatives is to make sure that the, the clear leadership that the PM, the Chancellor, Matt and others are showing is reflected in the messages that we get across. And of course, the other thing is that for people listening and watching, if you think there are ways in which we can sharpen our message, let us know, because you know, we benefit from having a huge array of, uh, of members who care about this country and want us to get it right. And of course, all that will be tested as we move through the next stages of Brexit, of course. Absolutely. Right? Big test. Now, the last question, maybe I've done it as they do it on the television and the radio, slightly different question at the end, just a little, little bit more personal question. So you've held all sorts of senior jobs in government, and the question comes from Jake Atterbury, and it simply says, which has been your favourite and why? Well, the, uh, the job that I least expected to have has been my favourite, and that was being Environment Secretary. Oh, yeah. um, I, um, I love being Education Secretary because it's a passion of mine. Being Justice Secretary and, and working um, in prisons trying to uh, break the, the, the cycle of crime was fascinating. But as Environment Secretary, um, I, I had a, a, a chance to play a role in making sure that the you know, I think one of the biggest challenges that we'll face in the next 100 years, which is climate change and the loss of biodiversity, we could develop the right answers to. It also meant that I met amazing people, people um, uh, not just in the, in the world of agriculture um, and fisheries, but also people who are responsible for um, maintaining and enhancing the beauty of this country. Um, you know, one of the wonderful things about 
uh, the whole of the United Kingdom, is that um, notwithstanding some of the problems that we've had over the last 20 or 30 years, it's still an amazingly beautiful, biodiverse, naturally rich place. Um, and you can find nature, uh, if you look for it, um, in the heart of our cities as well as in our countryside. And we need to value nature more. Um, I think all of us recognize that in the course of this crisis because, um, you know, as Emmanuel Macron said, there is no planet B. Um, we need to make sure that um, we hand on uh, this earth in a, in a better state to the next generation. And having a chance to play a part in that role and to meet those amazing people um, and to, you know, to contribute to perhaps one of the most important causes of, of our time, well, that was a privilege. And I suspect, Michael, you'll look back in years to come at some of the things you planted, the mm -hmm. seeds of it, that's not a terrible pun, yeah. to see come through, actually. So. I do hope so. OK, but lastly, can I just say a huge thank you for your honesty and openness in this, and hopefully we've covered lots of ground in a really short time piece of time. Thank you so much, Andy, and good luck in the next few months. For anyone who's listening, one of the most important decisions that people will be making next year is who will be the Mayor of the West Midlands Combined Authority. And Andy, I hope that people recognise the amazing job that you've done and that you are returned with a thumping majority. That's very generous of you. Thank you very much, Michael. Really appreciate your support. Thank you. Thank you.